Let's open our Bibles again to Exodus chapter 20. And there we will find verse 14. I'm going to read verses 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 so that we can see again the flow of thought that is given to us in these five words that God spoke to His people Israel. Those five words found in these last five commandments focus on loving our neighbor. If we are to love our neighbor as ourself, God said in verse 13, you shall do no murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to him belongs to your neighbor. In each of these last five commandments, there is one thing that stands out to us. When we compare what is said in the New Testament to what God says to His people here, we understand that the only way we can keep these last five commandments is because the fruit of the Spirit of God is being produced in our life. Never separate what is given to us in the Old Testament from what is said to us in the New Testament. Always understand that we as the children of God, if we're going to live according to the pattern of God, according to the plan of God, according to the principles of God, according to the law of God, the only way we can do that is to have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, living within us. We must indeed know the work of His Spirit within. Several fruits of the Spirit are evident in these five commandments. Listen to the fruits of the Spirit again in Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. In fact, without the fruits of the Spirit, there's no keeping of the law. If we do not love, if we do not know the peace of God, if we do not know the joy of God in our life, if we do not know the self-control of life, we cannot live this law. In fact, self-control is one of the primary things that is given to us in this commandment, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not gossip about your neighbor, you shall not covet. It's self-control. The work of self-control within us is necessary for us to know this way of life. Self-control is necessary because self-control enables faithfulness. That's what I'm going to talk to you about today when we talk about adultery. When God says you shall not commit adultery, He is basically saying you will be faithful. And what does God show to us when He says to us you will be faithful? He says to us you will be faithful. Why? Because God is faithful. And as we look at this passage today, we shall see the faithfulness of God. And we shall see our call to be faithful as well. Self-control is brought about by faithfulness. And faithfulness empowers self-control. Joseph was a slave in Potiphar's house. You know the story of Joseph sold by his brothers into slavery. He's in Potiphar's house. Potiphar, who is the chief captain or the primary officer of the bodyguard of the Pharaoh. Joseph has entered his house, and as time has passed, Joseph has earned the respect of Potiphar because Joseph has been faithful to his responsibilities. So Potiphar has given to Joseph the authority... By the way, the only way to have authority is to keep your responsibilities. 
and you'll be given authority because you're responsible. Authority doesn't come with an office or a title or a place. It comes because of keeping responsibilities. Joseph was given the authority over all that was in Potiphar's house. He was the chief steward. But one day Potiphar's wife sees Joseph and she sees this young man, this handsome young man who has such authority in her house. And her husband's always gone to work because the Pharaoh seems to have something going on all the time and the bodyguard needs to be there and Potiphar's spending a lot of time with the guys down at the office. And so she sees him and according to Scripture, according to Scripture, she literally invites Joseph to come to bed with her. Joseph refused. And what were the words of his refusal? The Scripture says, Joseph refused. My master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no greater one in this house than I, and he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How could I do this great evil and sin against God? faithfulness to his master. Oh, but did you hear this sin against God? Faithfulness to God. Faithfulness to God. Joseph exercised self-control because of faithfulness. And because of faithfulness, he exercised self-control. He would be faithful to God, faithful to His Master. In today's Word, you shall not commit adultery. We find the necessity of faithfulness. A faithfulness found in fidelity. Faithfulness to a person or to a belief that's demonstrated by continued loyalty and support. When God created man, He created us with three parts. We are a body. We are a mind. We are a spirit. All three of these parts in us, body, mind, and soul, are to be lived out in faithfulness. God's Word to man reveals that faithfulness or fidelity is found in our physical life, in our emotional life, and in our spiritual life. Isaiah, the prophet of God, saying, O Lord, You are my God. I will exalt You. I will give thanks to Your name, for You have worked wonders planned, formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. God is faithful. And He expects His people to reflect that faithfulness in all parts of their life. As we go through this message today, I pray that we will be a people who will guard our faithfulness to Him in body, mind, and soul. For adultery is found in the physical acts of man. Adultery is found in the mind of man. And adultery is found in the spirit of a man. Keeping this in mind, we also remember that family is a basic unit for the nation of Israel. Remember, he's given them the commandment already to honor their father and mother that their days may be long in the land. Family is important to God. God revealed to us in that passage his love for family. He brought man and woman together, made them one, told them to multiply and to fill the earth. The uniqueness of family is always in play as we read the stories of the Old Testament and the New. Family. Faithfulness within family is vital. Faithfulness in the marriage serves as a foundation for the family, and it serves as a foundation for the nation as well. 
Is it any wonder that in our nation today, our nation is reeling with instability because family is not given its place. Family is not finding faithfulness within the family. Adultery is not only a wrong that is committed against one's spouse, it is a sin against God. Whether it's a physical act with one other than your spouse, whether it is an emotional desire or a fantasy involving another, or whether it is an apostasy from God, the spiritual adultery. Adultery is a sin against God. Jesus said to us that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, according to Matthew, and Mark adds, with all our strength. King David recognized his adultery when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. He realized that his sin was a sin against God. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, he told the prophet Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David's confession of sin against God brought about forgiveness as Nathan responded, The Lord also has taken away your sin. You shall not die. However, because of this deed, you've given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The children all, or the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Did you hear that? Did you hear what Nathan the prophet said? You've given the enemies of the Lord an opportunity to blaspheme. Oh, nobody will be hurt by an act of adultery. Really? The relationship is torn. When a relationship between a husband and wife are torn, if there are children that have been born to that union, the children are then placed in jeopardy. If one is a part of a church, then the church knows that this has happened. Then the whole spirit of the church is infected by that sin. It's not a sin that is lightly, to be lightly taken. It is a sin that affects the marriage, family, the church, the community, the nation. But most of all, it is a sin that affects the relationship one has with God. David's adultery compelled him to write Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is the confession of his adultery, of his murder, and of his covetousness. We hear his plea to God as David speaks in Psalm 51. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. See, David understood the consequences of his sin. David understood that as a consequence of his sin, the child, the first child that is born to David in Bathsheba dies. It's interesting to note in Scripture that David has four other sons with Bathsheba. More sons with Bathsheba than any of his other wives. And one of those sons that he has with Bathsheba becomes king in his place when David becomes too old to serve and dies. Solomon is the son of David in Bathsheba. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Sounds like good news that Solomon, the son of the adulterous relationship, becomes a king. But let's remember what happened. Following David's adultery with Bathsheba, The nation goes into civil war. Absalom, that 
handsome son. That one described in Scripture as the most handsome man of the kingdom at the time. Absalom dies in battle. After he has committed an atrocity with his father's concubines. Life went south for David after his sin. Is it any wonder then he asked God to restore to him the joy of his salvation? You know, you would think with all the warnings that we have in both the Old Testament and the New Testament regarding adultery that people would get the message. You would think with all the social problems that come about because of adultery, the effect of adultery on the person himself, on the family, on the church, on the nation, one would think that we'd get the message. However, adultery continues its curse on our day because it's becoming socially acceptable and is a natural thing to do, they say. I say to you that we as the people of God need to declare clearly adultery is, according to God's holy word, the failure of faithfulness in marriage between a man and a woman and the failure of faithfulness to God himself in the spirit of the person, the family, the church, or the nation. Let's begin with marriage. The power of marriage in human life is without measure. Someone has said, two people can enjoy life, but two people made one can enjoy life a lot better. There's a great joy when two people come together to share in every area of their life, emotionally and physically and spiritually, as they carry out life together. There's a wonderful experience of life, and that life experience is so important to God that God determined that adultery should not be a problem in the marriages in Israel. In fact, God had a way to, to cause that to be true. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. If there's a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That solves the problem. The law said that the adulterer both man and woman, would die. Moses preaching in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22 said, If a man is found lying with a married woman, then both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. Thus you shall purge the evil from Israel. God called adultery evil. And the death penalty was pronounced. See, this is why it was so important for David to hear that he would not die. When the prophet Nathan said, you will not die, Nathan basically said, you're not going to be drug into court and we're going to accuse you and we're going to take you and Bathsheba out and we're going to stone you. Nathan said, that's not going to happen. Why? Because David repented the man after God's own heart who had committed such a despicable act and confessed his sin found forgiveness. You see, David's adultery began earlier than just the act with Bathsheba. Scripture says that David was on his rooftop one evening and he looked and he saw Bathsheba. Bathsheba was bathing in the cool of the evening on her rooftop. So you see, the adultery that David committed did not begin when he invited her over for dinner. It began in his own heart and in his own mind as he saw her there and coveted her. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, we are told that adultery is one of the works of the flesh. And Pastor James in James chapter 4, verse 4 says that adultery creates enmity with God. And it begins in the mind. Deals in true blood, who served as professor of philosophy at 
Erwin College in Illinois, and who also he's, he's a Quaker theologian. Passed away in 1994, but before he passed away, he wrote in his book, Foundations for Reconstruction, It is wrong to tamper with affections, and it is wrong to tamper with human life, and both acts are wrong for the same reason. You see, adultery is harmful to human personality. The act of adultery is born within the heart and the mind of the individual. Jesus said, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These things which defile the man. What defiles us? What we take in, uh, he says, what defiles us is what's in our mind, what we think, how we plot, how we direct our life. Jesus made clear that the destructive nature of tampering with affections and the impact on the person's life when he said in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it is said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks on a woman who lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So that was David's problem. He saw Bathsheba, and in his heart he lusted for her. The Hollies, Linda Ronstadt, Doris Torrey, and others may tell us that just one look is all it took, but whether it's rock and roll or whether it is soul or whether it is ragay, it is that one look beyond the object of life's affection for our marriage partner and for our God that creates the defeat of faithfulness in life. We need to guard our mind. We need to guard our mind by what, from, from as we see. Oh, we may see something funny regarding sex and laugh. We may see something titillating regarding sex, and it draws us into the movie. Regretfully in our age, there are too many men and women who are well acquainted with pornography sites and those individuals who are on those pornography sites. When I hear a Christian person tell me the name of someone who is now an actor or actress that it's well known that they were once members of the pornographic society, I kind of wonder where they got their first information. It is important for us to guard our heart, to guard our mind, to guard what we see, to guard what we hear, to guard what we read. I lost a deacon in a church because his wife spent more time reading romance novels than she spent in romancing her husband. In fact, he and she found themselves eventually in adulterous affairs with others because of what was being taken into the mind by one and what was being left out of the life of the other. We need to guard our mind and we, ask, we need to ask the Spirit of God to guard our mind and to guard our eyes and to guard our ears Because, my dear friends, what we take in is who we become. What dwells in our heart. You must not commit adultery, whether physically or even in your mind. You see, Scripture is very clear about the fact that adultery finds its roots in spiritual warfare. Dwelling in our world today, the battle between Satan, evil, the unholy spirits, and the Spirit of God 
is very real. And he attacks in ways of subtlety that we don't even think about or realize. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts. Oh, God, transform our hearts. Transform our minds. Cause us to look for holiness. Cause us to seek after faithfulness. Cause us to walk with you. Then there is that spiritual adultery, the abandonment of God for another hope or deliverer. This form of adultery was well known to Israel. When God said, do not commit adultery, He, he, he spoke to them about that physical relationship within the family. But when, when adultery was committed within those physical relationships within families, it spilled over into the attitude of the nation. And the nation began to look for other ways to find strength, to find security, to find life, to find happiness, to find joy, to find fulfillment. In fact, we find that for Israel, they, they came to the point where they wanted to form alliances with powerful pagan kings and armies instead of trusting God. God spoke a word to Jeremiah the prophet, which really clears this scene completely. In Jeremiah chapter 3, Then the Lord said to me, Jeremiah, in the days of Josiah the king, have you seen what faithless Israel did? Did you hear that? Faithless Israel. Not faithful. Faithless. She went up to every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. On every high hill. That was the places of worship for the pagans. On every high hill and under every green tree. These sound like lovely locations until we recognize that he was talking about paganism. She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. I thought, after she has done all these things, she will return to me. She'll come back. But she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it, and I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah didn't fear, but she went and was a harlot also because of the whiteness of her harlotry. She polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees, that which is lifeless. Idols. Do you hear what God is saying to Jeremiah? He's saying this adultery looked pleasant, but it was destructive. It literally brought about death, not because of a death penalty, but because it was destructive in the heart and the life of this people. And not only that, her sister saw her do it, and she thought, well, she's getting by with that. I can do it too. See, this is one of the destructive things about adultery. I'll touch on that in a second. Hosea, the prophet of God. Hosea presented God as a faithful husband. And Israel as is an unfaithful wife. Hosea's theme was not so much the righteousness and justice of God as Amos had preached, but Hosea stressed the knowledge of God and loyal love toward God. God's love for Israel would not permit God to give up on Israel in spite of their lack of knowledge of Him and their spiritual infidelity. So God wanted to show to Israel His love for them and their faithlessness, their failure to be faithful. In Hosea's prophecy to the northern ten tribes, God instructs Hosea to take to himself a wife to marry a woman who would be unfaithful in their marriage. That lack of faithfulness was to be a picture to Israel of how Israel was disregarding God in their sin. To the union of Hosea and his wife were born three children. There was Jezreel which means God will scatter. God was warning them of the coming captivity. There was Lorumah, not pitied, symbolizing judgment and no longer extending God's blessing to the 
nation. And then finally came Loami. Loami, not my people. Showing the broken relationship that adultery would bring, spiritual adultery would bring between God and His people. Hosea cries out, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for he, you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Assyria will not save us. We will not ride on horses. We will not say again, Our God, to the work of our hands, in which you, God, the Father, will find mercy. How would God react to the one who returns from their apostasy, from their adulterous acts? God said, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. God forgave when they repented, confessed, and returned to God. God forgave David of his adultery when David repented, confessed, and returned to God. God forgives the nation that will repent, confess, and return to God. But let me say to you, it begins with a mind that is not set upon adultery, but a mind that is set upon God, a heart that is pursuing the things of God. David, a man after God's own heart, thank God David was pursuing God continually because even when he faltered, fell, Sin. He would return to this one whom he pursued. Oh, that we would be a people who would pursue God and all that is His. Because adultery does harm. I was the second pastor to follow a particular pastor at a particular church. Where that pastor had had a relationship that almost sunk his own marriage. And when it was found out, he resigned and left the church. But shortly after his left, there was suddenly a spat of divorces within the church. About four of the younger couples in the church divorced as they traded husbands and wives. You see, when sin enters in, it gets a grip. When sin is allowed to be pursued, it destroys. That church didn't recover with the next pastor. They split again. That was one of the hardest fields of ministry I've ever been on. Because sin had had its stranglehold on the lives of the people. And it was adultery of mind, of body, and of spirit that gave sin free right. I say to you, my friends, guard your mind and heart against any influence of sexual impurity and sin. Guard your mind and heart against anything that will divert your faithfulness from God. Because when we are no longer faithful to God, we will find ourselves wallowing in the unfaithfulness of life. For it is God who keeps us. It is God who secures us. It is God who gives us wisdom and instruction. Oh, Father, how I pray that we would be a people faithful to You. Faithful with our body that we would not sin against You. 
that we would not bow before another God, that we would not make with our hands false gods, that we would not in any way devalue the marriage covenant that we have made before You. Oh, Father, I pray today that we might guard our mind, that we might be true before You, that our mind would be filled with Your Word, that our heart would have Your Word within it and upon it. Father, we would never be without wisdom from Your Word. May we guard what we see and what we hear, what we take into our mind. Let us, O Lord, let our minds be set upon holiness and righteousness. And Father, may we never be found to be a people unfaithful to You. But let us live in faithfulness before You, to You. Let us honor You, O Lord. And Father, indeed, there is no other God before You in our life. Let us be a faithful people. In Jesus' name. Amen. May God bless you this morning. We'll do lunch.